anything? Is it? Yep. Is it? Yes, I've seen notes. Hurry. <laughs> Hurry. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Kirsten. I'm part of the marketing team at Flores Books, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here with you at Blackwell's to celebrate the launch of Alex Malarkey's second book, The Edge of the Silver Sea. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening, and thanks to Matthew and the team at Blackwell's for hosting us. Um, and welcome to those that are joining us through the power of the internet on the live stream. Um, before we dive in, I just want to make sure everyone knows about the prize draw to win some postcards featuring some character art. Um, and we've also got a free copy of the book, so if you haven't yet put your name in the magical hollowed out book, which is just over there, make sure you do that by the end of the event. Um, and I think that's all I have to say before we get started. So, The Edge of the Silver Sea is an absolute page turner um, of a fantasy adventure novel with a pretty fantastic cover um, illustrated by Ramona Craigstita, who is somewhere hiding around here. She's fantastic, very talented, <laughs> very modest, but hooray for the wonderful cover design. Um, it's the story of 13-year-old Blair, who's been forced to move with her parents to the remote island of Roscoe in the Outer Hebrides. Alex describes it rather beautifully as an island all alone at the edge of the Silver Sea. In a place like this, anything could happen. And something does indeed happen, as you would expect, um, when Blair meets a mysterious woman with antlers and strikes a bargain that sets her off on a magical quest, unravelling the island's secrets and making some new friends along the way. Jenny Skinner, who's the main editor of the book and is also hiding um, somewhere in the audience, here she is, <laughs> uh, she wanted me to share that, that we know how, how long this story has been with Alex. It has been some time... Um, and we know it's a very special one and we all feel very, very privileged to have worked together with Alex to bring it to readers. Um, and of course, Alex themselves, always such a pleasure to work with. Um, so for those of you that don't know already, I think most of you probably do, but just in case, Alex Malarkey is a writer and vet nurse who lives on the edge of Edinburgh. Their work with wildlife, from transporting injured seals as a marine mammal medic to scanning the sea for whales and dolphins with shore watch, inspires their stories about nature and magic. Alex loves to explore Scotland's wild coasts and islands in their free time, and in fact, they've not long returned from a 200-mile cycle tour along the Hebridean Way, visiting six schools to talk about the edge of the Silver Sea along the way. Um, their sponsor trip has raised over a thousand pounds for Mermaid's Charity, which supports trans non-binary. Yes, huge round of applause. <laughs> Incredible achievement. Um, in a moment, I'm going to stop talking and hand you over to Alex, who will tell you more about the book um, and read an extract for us. And then it'll be over to you to ask Alex all of your burning questions before we draw the winner of that very important prize draw. Um, and then there will be some more time to buy books and get them signed at the end. So please put your hands together one more time and give a very warm welcome to Alex Malarkey. Thank you, everyone. Wait, is that working? How about now? Hello? Oh, well, she's going to turn them on at the same time. And then she'll keep you up. OK. Hi. <laughs> Um, first of all, thanks to everyone, because loads of you donated to the fundraiser for Mermaids, so thank you very much. I also want to say thanks to everyone so much for masking today. Um, really, really appreciate that. We've just taken ours off because we're a bit of a distance away, um, and I also <laughs> get really nervous and can't breathe when I have to talk, so um, yeah. Um, thank you so much for masking. I don't really know what to tell you about this book. I started... Okay, I, I, know, I know what to tell you. Um, I started this book in 2015 when I was fresh out of uni and, well, I was actually back in uni. <laughs> um, I was doing a master's degree when I was living in Melbourne with Laurel and um, I was studying screenwriting and I had to come up with a concept for a film. And um, I don't know where I got this from, but I was missing Scotland because I just left St Andrews um, and really wanted to write something set in Scotland. So... Um, that's where the idea originated from. Um, and then, at that time, I think I was mentally closer in age to Blair, who is the teenage main character. I mean, I was only, like, fresh out of being a teenager myself. Um, 
And at this time, I am now the same age as Blair's mum, <laughs> Anna, um, because it has taken about nine years. Um, basically, after it was a screenplay, I decided I didn't want to work in the film industry. Um, so um, I adapted it into a book. Um, and then with The Sky Beneath the Stone getting published, it kind of got put um, on the back burner for a while. And then, yeah, just lots and lots of um, rounds of editing and trying to make the book. Uh, yeah, me and my agent called it the seven-year curse because at the seven-year point, I got completely stuck and I was like, I actually don't know what I'm going to do with the story. I just don't feel like I connect to the main character anymore. I'm not sure how to, to fix that. And I can't remember how, but um, I had the idea that Blair should be an activist. Before that, she was an artist, but um, didn't have that like activism element to her character. Um, and that just like made it all make sense suddenly. Um, I've done some activism in my past, um, and yeah, I just suddenly could understand why she was so desperate to get back to her friends and to their like organising that makes her feel like everything is going to be okay. Um, so that's why, yeah, that's that broke the seven year curse. And the book finally got published, so here we are. Um, yeah. Um, I'm not sure what else to say. I'll, um, I'll read you a bit, and then we can just do questions. <laughs> That's probably just easier. Um, so the premise of the book is that Blair moves to Roscoe with her parents, and her parents have always wanted to open a bed and breakfast on the Isle of Roscoe. Um, and when I was... Nine, I think. My parents moved us. My parents are over there. Um, <laughs> they moved us all from London up to Cumbria um, to quite a remote um, area on the west coast and um, spent the next like 10 years renovating the house. Um, in the book, they have six weeks to renovate the house. Um, and yeah, it was definitely inspired by my parents' efforts um, on our house. Um, so, yeah, they're going to open their bed and breakfast. Blair really wants to just go back to the mainland. Um, she, even though she's she's an environmental activist, yeah, she's like l losing all those ties to the people that she, to her best friends and all the work that they've done together. Um, so, she makes a wish out loud for a way home, and she is answered. Um, Kaliak is a woman with antlers who appears and says to Blair that she is one of the Fey folk. Um, and she tells Blair that Roscoe is one of the last places in the world where the human and fae realms still overlap. So what that means basically is that where belief in magic has dwindled, the two realms have kind of peeled apart, and where belief is still strong, there's still um, like interaction between those two. So in on the Isle of Roscoe, there's still a strong belief in um, magic and in the creatures and stories of folklore, and because of that, um, the yeah, um, the these creatures still share the island with the human inhabitants, whether the humans realise it or not. So, Kaliak tells Blair that she can grant her wish if Blair will perform three tasks for her to help her kin, the other Fey folk on the island, and to help Kaliak with her. Her goal, which is to protect the deer. She is a guardian, um, and her role, there's a guardian for each, each, um, each species, um, every aspect of the, live, of the natural world, basically. So like every species of tree and flower and um, ecosystems, like the river has its own guardian, and Kaliak is the guardian of the deer. So her goal is just to protect the deer. And the first task that she gives Blair is to find the Kelpie that is preying on her deer and get rid of it. Um, does anyone know what I mean by Kelpie? Yeah? Like a brownie? Not a brownie, but brownies do appear. Yeah? Uh, yeah, it is, it is a type of dog. That's my brother. Um, <laughs> we have a Kelpie um, called Finn. Oh, who, who wrecked the book that you're all signing? Um, yeah. Yes, it's a water horse. Well, so yes, it takes the form of a horse and it lives in the water. What form it takes under the water? Who knows? Um, it's a shapeshifter and yeah, they take the form of horses 
and will lure weary travelers onto their back and then um, drown them. So as soon as you touch a Kelpie, you're, you're done for. Um, yeah, so Blair has met a boy on the island called Alistair who is doing a survey of the deer. Um, they don't get along. Alistair doesn't believe that Kelpies are real, and, but he has agreed to let Blair tag along um, to, with him while he's doing his survey and she can look for her Kelpie. Um, so on this occasion, she is with, she's with Alistair and also with um, his little brother, Ewan. So, I'm going to read now. Look, said Alistair, we're almost at the spot I was telling you about. See how the river's widening? In a minute, we'll, get, we'll come to a big pool. It's a very popular spot for the deer to come and drink. I've seen... He stopped speaking suddenly. Blair had been looking out at the river, but when she turned back to the path, she saw a figure emerge from the fog ahead. She stopped dead. There was an animal on the path, half cloaked in mist. Its coat glistened in shades of auburn and umber. It was thicker and taller than the largest stag she'd seen on the island, with a longer face and stronger legs. A mane and tail black as the deepest loch drifted in the light breeze. It was unquestionably a horse, but at the same time there was something distinctly unhorse-like about it. Perhaps it was the pond green bridle on its head, reins dangling to the ground as though its rider had recently taken a tumble into the river. Perhaps it was the creature's eyes, shark black and glassy, and fixed unwaveringly on the three humans standing opposite it. Oh dear, Alistair said faintly. Whose horse is that? Ewan asked. That's not a horse, Blair said in a low voice. If it had been a horse, it would have looked away from them by now and started grazing, or even wandered away to eat in peace somewhere else. This creature was still staring at them. It's a Kelpie, Alistair breathed. If Blair hadn't felt fairly sure that her survival depended on keeping the Kelpie in her sights, she would have given him a very smug look in that moment. What do we do? Alistair asked. Blair zeroed in on the reins that trailed along the ground. If we get hold of its reins, maybe we can control it. Then we can lead it away. Get it on the ferry or something? That's a terrible plan, Alistair hissed, but Blair shrugged his comment off. I'll figure that part out later. You two stay here. Blair couldn't believe she was about to do this. The creature staring at her would eat her alive. She could see that in the intensity of its gaze, and it made her hands shake. But it was her ticket out of this whole mess, the only way she was going to get home. Taking a deep breath, Blair started walking towards the horse. It didn't look away, didn't even seem to blink. When she was barely a metre away, the Kelpie moved suddenly and she flinched, but it was only turning sideways, presenting her with its back. Its coat looked soft and warm. When she was little, she'd been desperate to learn how to ride, but they'd never had the money. If she wanted to, she could climb up and they could canter into the hills right now. She could live her childhood dream. No. She had to remind herself that this wasn't a horse. She had a job to do. She took a step towards the bridle, but the creature turned its head and without touching her, nudged her towards its back. It really wants me to mount, Blair realised. And why shouldn't she, really? If she was on the back of a Kelpie, no one could stop her from galloping into the village and boarding the next ferry out of this place. She could ride all the way home to Carlisle. No, Blair told herself firmly, again. The moment I touch it, it'll drag me into the river and I'll be dead. Her heart thundered. She was so close now that she could hear the huff of its breath smell the brackish scent of its fur. One wrong move and it could have her in its teeth. Blair clenched her fists, then flexed her fingers. She grabbed for the reins. The Kelpie tossed its head high and Blair's hands slipped on the slimy bridle. She stumbled backwards a step as she lost her grip and the Kelpie was on her in a flash, spinning round to lash at her with its teeth. Blair didn't feel the moment the bite connected with her, but she heard the tearing of fabric. She floundered backwards into something. Alistair. Come on! He grabbed her by the sleeve, and they ran. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, let's move on to some questions from you all. Um, does anyone want to kick us off? 
Cool. All right. I'll do it then. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's your favourite mythical creature? Um, selkies. Why? <laughs> um, I really love seals. I love working with seals. Um, I think they're amazing and they look so silly when they're on land and then they get in the water and they just look so like graceful. They're amazing. Um, and yeah, I've always re just really loved selkie stories. The idea that there are seals that can like take their skins off and walk on land as people. Um, yeah, so there's selkies in the book, of course. Nice. All right, come on audience, let's have a question. There we go. Oh, um, were there any mythical creatures I didn't include because they were too scary? <sighs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I did try, I mean, I wanted the creatures to be kind of creepy. Um, they're scary, but they're actually, they mean well. They just can't help it that they're scary. Mm. <laughs> Sally? Um, when I started writing this, I actually hadn't been to any Scottish islands, oh, except the Isle of May um, in the fourth, but um, I hadn't been to any of the Hebrides, and I guess it was just like an idea of Scotland that I had. Um, but then since I started, which obviously was a long time ago now, um, visited a lot of the islands, and the, it was originally based on Jura, which was because Jura has like a huge population of deer, like like loads of deer to each person that lives on the island. And they have the legend of Kaliak, who is not, not the Kaliak of Scottish folklore, but like the Kaliak of the deer who protects the deer. Um, so that's where that idea came from. Um, but I visited Jura and I just realised like I didn't want to write a book about somewhere I didn't know personally. Um, so. Or may, I, think it, I think I actually already changed it before that, but yeah, so I decided it was going to be set on a, an imaginary island instead. And that gave me a lot more freedom to, to make, like, make it how I needed it to be. Um, and then I visited Colonsay and went there for a, a writing retreat for a week, um, just like rented a cottage and wrote. And I was like, this is Roscoe. <laughs> like, just because it's so small, it's got like one road around it, um, and just little hills and um, yeah, so that's probably the closest island to Roscoe. But yeah, Roscoe is um, not not any specific island. It definitely changed a lot from when it was Jura. Yeah. Um, I'm always very curious to know how like the seals are characters. Um, so how do your characters, or the main characters, well, the main character we talked uh, a little bit about. But how do you, what elements, where do you, um, like, say, for the inspiration to build those characters? Mm. Um, I guess, like, my in my middle grade books, they're often based, like, inspired by my experiences when I was a kid. So, like, moving to a remote-ish area, not 100 miles from the mainland, but, like, being remote-ish. Um, and... Yeah, I'm not sure. I think, well, I was saying to my friend the other day that The Sky Beneath the Stone is my, like, be kind to yourself book, and then this is my angry book. So this is, like, <laughs> the angry side of my teenage years. Um, um, yeah, still angry as well. Um, <laughs> I don't really know. Um, I'm not, I don't have, like, any major insights into character, to be honest. Um, I just sort of figure out what I need them to do, and then I figure out why they would do it. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess in that way, the plot kind of comes first um, a little bit. But, yeah, I needed Blair to be the kind of person who would, <laughs> who would make a fairy bargain. Um, so someone who um, just, like, couldn't see sort of the risks in doing that. Um, and then her parents um, were quite inspired by my parents. Um, <laughs> Um, just very hard working and um, the dad loves a good book. My mum also loves a good book, to be fair. Um, and, um, yeah. Um, yeah, so Blair changed a lot over the years with how I changed. And, yeah, 
and yeah, her mum's storyline changed a lot um, because I became her mum's age and was like, oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> 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 you can kind of see more where she's coming from now. Actually, I was talking to my friend Catherine about this um, recently, about how now it's kind of like, oh, I'm moving to an island to start a bed and breakfast. That sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> like, that sounds like a dream. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, just sort of like um, bits of my own experience and then, yeah, basically whatever the plot needs them to do. <laughs> if you encountered a Kelpie, would you try and ride it? Um, if I encountered a Kelpie, I would not try and ride it because I'm just not that into horse riding these days, you know? <laughs> I might try and bring it home. Um, my, the Kelpie in the book is just literally um, my horse who passed away. Um, I just described him exactly because um, I thought it would be nice. And he had, like, a very wild streak, so, yeah, he definitely had Kelpie energy. Oh, lots of questions up the back. I think I see... I think so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's like three numbers. Oh, yeah. Um, so I visited six schools when I was in Outer Hebrides, which was the last two weeks, the previous two weeks. Um, and yeah, it went really well. I mean, basically, I, I did this, I had a workshop planned for each school, um, mostly worked with P6, P7. But then some schools it was like P4 to 7 because it's covering a large area um, and there's not that many kids around. Um, and we, the workshop was retelling stories from folklore. So like um, I talked them through all the different creatures in the book and then we like planned, we talked about like what retellings are, what folklore is and then planned we just did, yeah, just planned stories. Like, some of the kids got really um, enthusiastic and wrote their stories as well. But the focus of the session was just sort of plan, which I think was really nice because I don't know that they do that very often. I think there's a lot of focus on just, like, let's just start writing a story. Um, but planning is, like, one of my favourite parts. Like, and seeing all the kids, um, like, scribblings, I was like, just draw, like, just make a map, like, do whatever you want. Um, you don't need to be worried because no one's going to mark this. Um, and they're just like writing in every direction on the page and there's like a big map and then it's got all the, all the creatures annotated um, and there were some amazing ideas and now I'm obviously going to go blank and not remember what any of them were. <laughs> but um, yeah, I was just like encouraging them to um, think of a story that they like and, and try and retell it. I did have to have a lot of discussions about plagiarism <laughs> and, <laughs> and where I would be like, maybe you should change these characters' names. Probably can't have like Spider-Man in there, but <laughs> I mean, it only really matters if you're going to publish it. So, you know, it was getting a bit in depth for the kids actually at that stage. So, um, yeah, it went, it went really well. Um, the last school was an absolute highlight. It was like, it was a secondary school in Stornoway and they had got together a group of, um, people who all loved writing from across the year groups into um, the library and the librarian was lovely and had set up like a display of different books about folklore and um, they were just a great group so it was a real like real high note to end on so yeah it was it was great thanks for asking I think there's another question up in the back row yes Oh, what are my favourite things about Scotland? Um, love the landscape, obviously. <laughs> um, I think, wow, I've not actually thought about this before. Um, hmm. I mean, it's just like as soon as I was old enough, this is where I chose to live. Uh, we went to Australia for a few years in between, but then we came back. Um, I think it's, oh, the wildlife. Love the wildlife. Um, and, I, yeah, we were talking yesterday about um, travelling abroad and I was like, I don't really even feel the need to travel abroad anymore because it's just like so many amazing places still to see in Scotland and, and elsewhere in the UK. Um, I think there's just, I don't know, it's like the wildness and it's such a beautiful country and um, people are lovely. Yeah, it's just a great place, isn't it? I mean, we all obviously think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, apart from like, your experience of living in Scotland, is there something in particular that inspired you to write about like, folklore and 
Um, I did English at uni, and I, I wrote my dissertation on folklore, so I think that's probably where my interest started. Actually, you know what it was? It was my sixth form English teacher. We did Angela Carter's, um, what are they called? The Bloody Chamber. Um, we studied that, and we were talking about retellings all, all year long. It was just amazing, um, and she was so passionate about it. And she had us listening to Florence and the Machine and like dissecting her songs. Um, it was just great. So I think she probably got me to love folklore. Her name was Mrs. Jarrett, just in case she's listening. Um, and yeah, she yeah. So after that, I've just always always been really interested in folklore. And I think it's like I don't know, just a really rich like um, there's just a lot to draw on. And there's so many different ways of telling it. Like I was, I was saying to all the school groups, a hundred people could retell the same story, and every retelling will be different just because of like how different each person is, and like how, how different your worldview is. And you know, you might pull out completely different themes from that story than someone else would. Um, so I think that's it. Just it feels nice to draw on a tradition. Um, what's something I would want people to take away from reading the book? Hmm. I mean, there's definitely environmental themes in there. Um, there's a lot of sort of debate about how humans can live in balance with nature um, and dif very different approaches from different characters. Um, so it would be interesting to hear when you've read it what you think. Um, but there's also a lot about identity um, I changed a lot from when I first started writing this book um, and yeah the themes that came out in the in the last drafts um, were a lot were quite different um, and yeah just sort of about like showing the world who you really are um, that's a big part of it as well Did I have any magical experiences on my Hebrides adventure? Yes, I did. <laughs> I was just um, cycling over a causeway. I now can't remember. I think I was going from Bembecula to Grimsey. And, oh no, I was, you know, it it's probably it doesn't matter which causeway it was. Um, but I was going over a causeway and I saw these Shetland ponies standing by a loch. And I was like, oh, that's so cute. Um, and then one of them just started walking into the water <laughs> and I had to pull over and start filming because this pony just like waded into like chest deep. I wish I had a projector so I could show you. Um, and waded across to an island to graze and they just started eating. So that was very cool um, Kelpie experience. Um, I also saw short-eared owls, which was amazing. They were hunting. I, I mean, I heard... So the bird, there is a significant bird in the book. It's an owl. Um, it used to be like a, sw a swift. Um, and then I watched Wild Isles with David Attenborough, and there was a feature on short-eared owls and how they live in the Hebrides and they hunt by day. Um, and I was like, oh, my God, that's so cool. So I changed it so it was short-eared owls. And I saw two, and they were hunting right outside this little like hut that I was sleeping in for the night, it was just like a wooden hut with a mattress inside, and it was like the coziest night's sleep I had on the whole trip. Um, and yeah, I was having my tea in the morning, and they were just there, couldn't believe it. Yeah, I took a video of that too on my Instagram, if you want to see. <laughs> but yeah, those are probably the two most magical experiences. Oh, there's loads, actually. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of wildlife. So yeah, I definitely recommend doing the Hebridean Way. If you, um, you can walk it as well. Um, or you could just like go visit the island because yeah, it's just wildlife everywhere. <coughs> Ali. Not to start a Hebridean turf war, but can you say which <laughs> island is your favourite? <laughs> <laughs> um, my favourite island. Um, hmm. <laughs> uh, my favourite island was probably. Oh. Well, the first night on Vatase was. So just, there's this like, it's a tiny, tiny island and it has this section that's got 
a beach and then like just a really small amount of land and then another beach like to the Atlantic. Um, and it was just, um, that's where I camped the first night and it didn't rain and made my tea on the beach and it was amazing. So that's a very, very fond memory. Um, Grimsey was really beautiful as well. It was very small and it had a boat museum um, <laughs> and a really nice harbour. Um, but yeah, I mean, to be honest, the whole, every island was amazing. It was a really good trip. Mm. Um, my research process involves a lot of Googling. <laughs> um, hmm. I'd already heard of Selkies and Kelpies just through stories I've read. Um, and then, yeah, just like it genuinely was a lot of Googling. Um, I, oh, but I, I was doing, for a while I was doing an apprenticeship at the Scottish Storytelling Centre, which anyone can do, by the way, and it's free. I have stopped doing it because I realised I don't thrive in a storytelling environment. <laughs> I can read it from a book, but I, I can't like perform a story, but that's okay. Um, it was a great experience, um, but I heard loads of great stories when I was doing that. And I've been to a few like events at the Scottish Storytelling Centre, and they're, they're amazing. Just like um, local storytellers get up on stage and will just tell you a story. It's, it's really great. Um, so that was a good, a good source as well. And they've got loads of good books in their shop about um, folk tales. And Kelpies have loads of books of Scottish folklore as well. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, over there. Uh, what was your favourite character from your life? Or is that different to just your favourite character from your own? Oh, um, my favourite character to write was Alistair. I love Alistair. He did not exist in the original story. Um, originally, it was just Blair like befriending lots of old people and, um, well, people of all ages, but no one her age. Um, and then um, I think my agent, Zoe, hi Zoe, if you're listening, um, suggested that she should have a friend her age. <laughs> so, um, so Alistair came about because of that. And then that actually just made the story way, way better. Like It all just like fell into place um, because Alistair is very key to the second task and, um, yeah, so Alistair is really fun to write because he um, is also an environmentalist, but he's like he doesn't um, doesn't approve of Blair's like school striking. Um, but then he goes to a school that has like a hundred kids, not even that. Um, so he and he's the one who does like a survey of the deer. So yeah, he's he's all about ecology. She's all about activism, and they clash a lot. Um, but then they become friends. Spoiler alert. Um, my favourite character in the book is probably, oh, you know what, Kaliak is really fun to write because she's just like, so sus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Blair doesn't think so. So, um, yeah. I mean, it's just really fun to write a really tall woman with antlers who doesn't wear shoes and just talks mysteriously about the deer. So, yeah. <laughs> also, happy birthday, Catherine. <laughs> Yay. Any others? Yes. Do you really enjoy ending a book with a hearty meal? Like <laughs> Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> I feel that's fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what's the best dinner you've had with your uncle? <laughs> <laughs> so Tigger just pointed out, Tigger is their derby name, um, just pointed out that I enjoy ending a book on a hearty meal, um, which is something that I hadn't noticed until um, Tigger pointed it out to me recently. Um, the best meal that I've ever eaten, oh, I actually do know this, um, so I was hitchhiking through Belgium and um, it was because of, it was like a university thing where you had to like race to a city, so we were racing to Prague and we got as far as Belgium, I think Brussels, and we were stuck and we ended up at the train station which is a really bad place to try and hitchhike <laughs> and <laughs> And then we, um, this like really lovely older Belgian couple came up to us and were like, we'll take you home. And we were just like, thank you. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, we were just grateful <laughs> for any help, to be honest. Um, and they drove us um, to Leuven, I think, where the Stella Artois place is, the brewery. Um, and they lived in a commune with their friends around this beautiful courtyard. 
and they gave us French onion soup, and I was so hungry. <laughs> that French onion soup was the best meal I've ever had in my life. So, yeah. Good question. <laughs> I think this is a good point to move on to the prize draw. So could one of the oh, Polaris yeah. team please grab the magical holdout book? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And Alex, do you want to pick someone to yeah. come and draw names? Oh, um, would you like to? Would you like to draw some names for us? If you're feeling up to it, no pressure. Okay, so will we do so character we art, two sets of character art, yeah. and then the book? So we're going to have three winners. Two winners will get um, some lovely character art postcards, and then the third winner will get some correct character art postcards and a free copy of the book. So on you go, pick the first winner for us. What does it say? It's Tigger. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, do you want to just put that down and then pick the second one for us? And winner number two, Catherine Hennesley. <laughs> and last one, Amy Parent. Yay! Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Here you go. All right. Alex, is there anything else you would like to say before we finish? Um, I would like to say that my friend Sky McKenna is here who wrote the Hedge Witch series and is having the launch for her third book, Sea Witch, on the 4th of October. So if you'd like to come along, please do. We're going to be in Sterling at the Book Nook. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. So thank you so much to Blackwells for having us this evening and for choosing The Edge of the Silver Sea as their children's book of the month for September. I'm very delighted. Thanks to all of you for joining us, both in real life and online. Um, Alex will be signing books over by uh, the Till Point, um, so please do get your books signed. Are you doing it here? Okay, Alex is going to be signing books here. The Till Point is over there if you have not, per not yet purchased your book. And there will also be cake just over here as well, so please do make sure you grab a slice of cake before you go. I will also say a massive thank you to Kelpies for hosting this event and to Blackwells, well, for, to Blackwells for hosting and to Kelpies for organising. Thank you, Kelpies. Um, and thanks to my mum, because my mum made this bunting here with the book's colour scheme. So. It's fabulous. <laughs> okay. Special round of applause just for the bunting, I think. And, okay, so let's just finish off one more giant round of applause for the wonderful Alex Malarkey. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.